everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We have an amazing lineup of experts and campaigners here to give a deeper look into our Thermo Fisher campaign and also answer any questions folks may have. Um, so there'll also be an opportunity to do a Q&A towards the end of the panel. Uh, my name is Tenzin Youngzom and I am the grassroots director at Students for a Free Tibet International. Um, our coalition here, along with groups like um, International Tibet Network, Free Tibet, U.S. Tibet Committee, um, Swiss Friendship, Tibetan Friendship Association, have launched this campaign um, against the Fisher. And this panel actually takes place in the midst of our Global Week of Action, where we have um, Tibet supporters all around the world taking action virtually and in person throughout the week. Um, and so every day of the week, we have a new action that folks can do. And so we kickstarted this on Monday. Today is Wednesday. Uh, so proud to say our first action on Monday was a targeted email campaign to Thermo Fisher headquarters, CEO Mark Casper and um, Chief Communications Officer Sandy Pound. And we have sent in over 2,371 emails directly to Thermo Fisher headquarters. Um, so they are definitely hearing us loud and clear um, starting on Monday. And yesterday we did a uh, photo action where folks had put their palms up and wrote hands off Tibet and DNA and folks participated all around the world and that went really well. And throughout the weeks, folks will be uh, peti uh, petitioning, uh, protesting at their official locations, Chinese consulates, Chinese embassies. So um, stay tuned to see what all the amazing things that happen throughout the week. And just to provide a quick background on Thermo Fisher. Um, so Thermo Fisher signed an, a series of agreements with police forces in occupied Tibet to supply DNA kits and other components that the most recent being um, an agreement in September 2022 that um, is worth over 160,000 US dollars. So these agreements coincide with the release of two detailed reports from um, Human Rights Watch and Citizens Lab that um, kind of detail that authorities have been collecting DNA from as many as 1.2 million Tibetans, including children as young as five years old without parent consent. And I think many of you guys know here, Tibet is already under complete lockdown, um, a total police state, and it's already one of the most repressed um, places in the entire world. And so although this news comes out and it's a bit um, maybe not unshocking to many of us who have, have been seeing this kind of stuff. It still also is alarming that in a place that seems like things can't get much worse, it is continuing to, um, you know, get, to continue to get worse. Um, so, yeah, so to pause from there, and I'm going to, first of all, thank everyone for being here today, especially our amazing um, lineup of panelists here. So, I'm going to introduce them one by one and have them um, share their thoughts um, and their point of views. And I'd like to start with Dr. Uwe Meya. Um, he may look familiar to some of you guys because he's also in our Tibet movement as well. Um, but today he's here because of his expertise um, on this discussion and on this panel. And so Dr. Uwe Meya is a doctor specializing in neurology and psychiatry and has considerable experience in the realm of clinical research. He is based in Switzerland and has worked with renowned biotech and big pharma companies and currently serves as the chief medical officer at a Swiss-based biotech company. In his research, he remains a steadfast advocate for ensuring ethical responsibility in the clinical projects he execute, executes. And his work was even recognized by the Global Development Leadership Award of a large pharma company in 2002. And he has also been a strong advocate for human rights in Tibet with his work at Swiss Tibetan Friendship Association. And his most recent output was the book Focus Tibet that summarizes 22 years of newsletters on human rights violations in Tibet. Uh, thank you, Uwe, for being here today. And I'd like to invite you to share some remarks. Yeah, thank you, Tanzum, Tanzin. And uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, we have learned, and we will learn further during this discussion, that Tamo Fisher's claim of just selling a very small amount of test kits uh, strictly for forensic purposes is anything but credible, and we will refuse that. Um, so we know already that uh, there is spillover from 
samples used for forensic use into research purposes. There have been papers published uh, using data on Tibetan DNA. And if that is the case, if research is performed like that, then very strict ethical guidelines apply. Um, first and foremost, uh, the guidelines from the World Medical Association, that is the so-called Declaration of Helsinki, apply. But uh, in more detail, they have also been formulated by any Western uh, regulatory agency uh, like the US uh, um, Food and Drug Administration or the European Medicines Agency. And these guidelines apply not only to research in patients, but also to research in healthy subjects. Um, and they apply also to procedures that are not obtaining biological specimens like DNA or others. So even to simply perform a blood pressure measurement or an EKG. And these guidelines circle around what is called informed consent. And there are very strict regulations what the informed consent has to contain. So to the subjects, um, an explanation has to be provided about the purposes of the procedures performed in, in them, like taking DNA samples in the Tibetans. And these explanations must be administered in a language that is understandable to the subjects. It is not coercive. It is not exculpatory. That means it does not coerce subjects to waive their legal rights and does not exaggerate benefits versus risks or inconveniences. Of note, assent by children must also be obtained apart from their parents' consent. And uh, this inform information must be provided in language understandable to children um, or other forms such as pictorial descriptions. And essence is explicitly defined as an affirmative agreement by the child to take part, not just the failure to object against it. It must also contain a statement describing the procedures adopted for data protection, confidentiality, privacy, and including duration of storage of personal data. And a statement must be provided to the subjects to ask questions and to withdraw consent at any time without consequences. And this consent must be adequately documented, ideally in writing. Now of interest is that uh, Thermo Fischer are in the ethical guidelines explicitly mentioning the declaration of Helsinki. Uh, they have bioethics guiding principles laid down in their charter and they have a bioethics committee in place to ensure adherence to what they call ethical business practices and standards. Uh, when you look at the composition of the committee, uh, it looks impressive at the first uh, glance, uh, but it is really um, ridiculous at a second glance because uh, it consists of the chief operating officer, chief scientific officer, and other leaders representing the life science and diagnostic businesses. So uh, it is not an independent committee, but essentially the people are supervising themselves. Uh, however, uh, Fisher says among the commitments, we require adherence to high ethical standards by our customers and external partners. And clearly we should be holding Thermo Fisher accountable to adhere to these principles in their sale of test kits to Tibet. Uh, with that, uh, let me stop and uh, continue with uh, the next speaker. Uh, thank you, Wei, um, for that. Up next, I'd like to invite um, Padin Zetong. Um, I think almost everyone knows Padin in our movement, but she is one of the most visionary and influential Tibet activists in the world. Uh, born in Canada, she has traversed the globe speaking to world leaders and spearheading campaigns advocating for human rights in Tibet. She has um, previously served as the executive director of Students for a Free Tibet and currently serves as the director at Tibet Action Institute, a nonprofit she founded that aims to strengthen strategic nonviolent activism through digital communication. She has been awarded the James Lawson Award for Nonviolent Achievement by the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict for her work and continues to be the leading spokesperson for Tibet. Uh, Jihadin. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Yangzum and SFT for organizing this. And I'm just going to set my timer here because I have a very hard time staying on time. Um, but I want to just for a moment, uh, think about the context 
uh, you know, that this, these tools would be uh, used in Tibet. So it's one thing to talk about, you know, uh, DNA sampling here when we talk about people, you know, opting into studies or um, all sorts of different um, ways that incredible advances in, in science and technology are used to help all of us be healthier. You know, uh, the, the possibilities are really endless in a free and open society. But as Yangzo mentioned in the beginning, you know, Tibet is not in the news these days. Um, we don't hear often about Tibet, even people following pretty closely the Tibetan issue are always asking and wondering what's happening in Tibet and, and what's the real situation on the ground, um, because we don't hear much. And I think it's important to know that that is by design, because the Chinese government has completely locked Tibet down and cut Tibetans off from the world in a way like almost no other place in the world. Uh, Freedom House every year does a does a index on civil and political liberties in the world. And Tibet sadly has ranked first uh, in terms of least free places on earth in the last number of years alongside Syria. But if you think about how much we used to hear or hear about Syria or other conflict areas in the world, and then you think about Tibet and how little we hear, it's really remarkable that, um, that it seems Tibetans are silent or that there's very little happening there. And I really um, can't emphasize enough that the, the picture for Tibetans has changed, the situation on the ground has changed drastically since 2008 and especially since Xi Jinping took power and uh, where thousands of Tibetans used to escape from Tibet every year into over the mountains, into Nepal, and then into India to live as refugees, but at least their kids could go to Tibetan schools or they could attend monasteries and be near to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Um, now the thousands that escaped every year has turned, that number has turned to barely a trickle, a handful, maybe two, three, five Tibetans make it out because Tibet has been so effectively sealed off. And that's through surveillance, that's through direct patrols at the border, and that's also through monitoring people in their home villages and really closely keeping tabs on Tibetans. And inside Tibet, Tibetans now live in such a climate of fear that any activity, if it's even remotely deemed political, like trying to preserve Tibetan language or having a Tibetan language writing class, all of these activities can be seen to be uh, undermining state security. Tibetans could be charged with subversion if the Chinese authorities decide that what they're doing is somehow criminal behavior or activity and Tibetans can go to prison and jail, be tortured, disappeared for such simple, simple activities. Not even, this is not even talking about running out into the streets and saying free Tibet or engaging in a uh, protest for Tibetan independence or human rights, uh, religious freedom. So if you think about the context where Tibetans can't get out. The world can't get in. No free media is allowed in Tibet. And the only media, international media that is allowed in, usually is taken on these guided tours. Um, so the world can't get in, certainly not international monitors, no UN agencies, uh, no NGOs. They really, the Chinese government has kicked all NGOs out of Tibet for the most part. Uh, Tibetans abroad who live in exile find it more and more difficult to travel to Tibet and even to engage in protest in the international community or advocacy for Tibet. Tibetans are now many scared to engage in any kind of political activity if they have family and friends back in Tibet because of transnational repression and the Chinese government threatening them and their families and their safety and their security and threatening to ban them from ever visiting Tibet if they even dare to talk about the political situation in the free world. So, we have 7 million Tibetans living under unbelievable surveillance, high-tech surveillance state like no other, um, essentially cut off and silenced. Uh, and, and, and then a company like Thermo Fisher comes along and tries to downplay the impact of their um, tools being used in Tibet and being actually sold to directly the 
police in Tibet. Now, this is not a free and open society where there are police watchdogs or we see the problems with police policing even in free and open societies. Imagine what can be done, not just with simple tools in a police state like Tibet or in the level of repression um, that Tibetans are living under and surveillance. Imagine what can be done, all the possibilities for um, advanced scientific tools, really weapons in the hands of the Chinese authorities and in, in the hands of the um, police in Tibet. Tibetans not only are at risk now, but in the future with this kind of surveillance or these kind of tools being deployed and Tibetan children. And I just wanted to make a point if people didn't know this now and I'll, I'll, I'll end here, but Tibetan children are at least 80% of all Tibetan school age children. So that's not just ages six to 18, at least 80%, but at least another 100,000 children on top of that, uh, ages four and five are now living in boarding schools and preschools. So the Chinese government has almost all Tibetan children in residential schools where their identity, their culture, language, everything is under attack and threatened language is threatened with really elimination in the next generation or so. In this context, to think about harvesting, mass harvesting of Tibetan DNA, to think about a corporation that is actually, I live in Massachusetts, that's just um, headquartered not far from my home. To think of people in that building, however small they may say the contract is, to think of anyone profiting from the use of tools in the Tibet I just described, the harvesting of DNA from young children who in many cases will not even be living with their parents, regardless of what the parents or they want. They've been removed, taken, stolen from their homes and put in these residential schools. To think about those tools being used in such a context is unthinkable, unconscionable, and really Thermo Fisher in engaging in this way is really engaged in helping China commit crimes against humanity as far as I'm concerned. And um, I hope I hope that, you know, I'm really impressed with this campaign, SFT, everyone's done an incredible job and I hope people's eyes will stay on this. And I think we need to send a message that if we, you know, if we can be successful here, it sends a message that Thermo Fisher in canceling any, saying they won't engage in any future contracts, in, in, in showing up and saying that this was wrong in some way, um, I think it sends a message to not just the Chinese government that what they're doing is unacceptable, but it sends a message to Tibetans inside Tibet that they have not been forgotten and that the world knows and understands uh, their suffering and their pain and we're still fighting for them, regardless of the silence or the quiet that people may think uh, engulfs Tibet now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, um, Acharan, for kind of putting things into perspective for everyone tuning in. I also wanted to send a quick reminder to folks who are watching um, the live stream to that you guys can submit questions for our panelists to answer at any point. So um, you can start submitting them now um, wherever you are watching. And the next person I'd like to introduce is Dr. Eve Moreau. Um, I actually chatted with him a couple of weeks ago before all this happened and was pleasantly surprised at all the work he's already been doing um, against Emma Fisher. Uh, so Eve Moreau is a professor of engineering at KU Leuven. His research focuses on artificial intelligence algorithms relevant to clinical uh, genomics and disease gene discovery. Eve notes the increasing development of mass surveillance technology and the larger trend of, of information technology being garnered in very harmful ways. Eve was selected as a fellow of the International Society for Computational Biology in 2018 for its contribution in bioinformatics. Um, pleased to have you here, Eve. Um, go ahead when you're ready. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So, so first of all, I'd like to address the, the, the idea of, yeah, well, DNA database, they, they help solve crimes when, when used uh, appropriately. Uh, and so you could ask, you know, what's the big problem of building such databases? And you can only understand that if you actually see the total architecture of uh, mass uh, surveillance and, and social control that is 
deployed in uh, several places. I've worked a lot on Xinjiang. We see similar patterns in uh, Tibet, which is a modalities of surveillance. It's not just that there is a DNA database. It is that, well, a citizen's lab has, for example, recently reported about mass iris scans, surveillance camera, uh, drone surveillance. All these modalities together create a, uh, an architecture, an infrastructure of social control. That, that is the real goal. It is actually to create an architecture that is so pervasive that it instills persistent fear and constant intimidation into the population. So you cannot just take the slice of DNA database separately and say, well, what is the problem here? You have to see it in its globality. That's the first thing I wanted to say. The, the second uh, thing is that uh, Tibet is a very special place for uh, DNA uh, research. So there is a fascination from a biological perspective for the uh, high altitude adaptation that developed over generations in the Tibetan population. And that these adaptations over many generations are now imprinted at the genetic level. So uh, biologists would like to understand uh, what is this genetic basis and what are the physiological effects uh, underlying the high altitude adaptation because this is closely linked to many different diseases. We see high impacts on the cardiovascular system, the pulmonary system, cognitive effects of high altitude. And understanding the biology of that might actually be really important for the global community to actually uh, understand key elements of other you know, uh, diseases. And so th that is a real fascination. If you explain this to biologists for 30 seconds, they will say, oh, yes, we need to understand that better. The problem is that there is a keen interest by authorities uh, controlling uh, uh, Tibet in actually the fact that that information about physiological adaptation, genetic adaptation, could actually be used for, on the one hand, military purposes. So Tibet is a quarter, or the Tibetan plateau is a quarter of the um, surface of, of China, and it's of high strategic importance to Chinese authorities, which have to station uh, military units there, which is really, really a big uh, challenge. So being able to better understand chronic uh, mountain adaptation and the diseases linked to that would actually help the military control of that region. Secondly, in the social control of the entire area, in actually having settlers live permanently in uh, Tibet, this is also very challenging. There are also important uh, long-term effects of uh, permanently living at three, 4,000 or more uh, altitude uh, if you are not adapted uh, for that. And just, just the short-term adaptation is not sufficient. You really actually have long-term challenges. So actually, I have seen in the literature interest for, in fact, identifying the genetic basis of this adaptation, for example, to screen settlers to identify those who are less likely to be to get ill if they live permanently at high altitude. So, so we have to really see that there is really an important component of, of potential social control in that type of, of research. And so it's it's actually even in my sense, it goes so far that you could use the terms of biocolonialism in that kind of research if it is misused uh, and also trying to identify the variability of populations is also part of, of social control in the broadest uh, uh, sense. So more on the forensic genetics, though, so the classical law enforcement type uh, database, and I'm using air quotes here because there is no clear view of a real impact on, on, on the ground of this technology. We know that Thermo Fisher has collaborated with Chinese public security in the past on scientific research to calibrate some of their products for use on Tibetan and Uyghur uh, populations. We have challenged some of those uh, publications, but we found really, really hard to actually get that type of science, which is really dangerous, retracted from the um, scientific records. And, and basically, publishers have not been uh, really helpful. So, so there is a kind of denial of the potential risk or actual risk of that type of research in multiple actors, not just Chinese authorities, but also uh, uh, um, uh, companies like uh, Thermo Fisher or Promega. 
and, and even part of the scientific community. So this is a global problem that we need uh, uh, to address. And, and I'd like to stop here. Uh, thank you, Eve, for providing um, that context. And last but not least, I'd like to invite um, Rhonda Gupta, who is based in the UK and is currently the campaigns manager at Some of Us. Some of Us is an organization advocating for corporate accountability and raising the standards for ethics-based uh, consumerism. She's been a spokesperson uh, for various campaigns, including the one that targeted Apple censorship in regions of Tibet, East Turkestan, and Hong Kong. Um, so she's not new to the movement. Um, and welcome back, and we'd be happy to hear your thoughts. Thank you. It's lovely to be back. And thank you, Yangzhou, Mladen, Uwe, and Eve for sharing your insights and knowledge and experience. So now you've given us a background and understanding of the problem. I'll share my thoughts on how we tackle it through the companies based in Western countries that are enabling the government of China and its human rights abuses. Many people actually want more than a simple transactional relationship with the companies they are customers of or investors in. There can be more to that relationship than the reductive one of buying a product or service because you like it or getting a financial return. There can be a lot more emotional involvement. Given that some corporations wield power and wealth greater than small countries, conscious consumers are also interested in knowing how the product they wish to purchase is made and that the money they are handing over isn't contributing to harm. The power of individual consumers, though, is limited to making the purchase or not. And while consumer boycotts can be powerful tools, they can only work if enough consumers act together, that there are credible alternatives. And the latter is tricky when companies enjoy a huge market share. They all operate with similar ethics and practices when they are so specialist, there is little competition or if they're not public facing, which is kind of the situation we're talking about today with, with Mo Fisher. Uh, and the need for sector wide shift can't really be serviced by a boycott. But shareholder engagement and activism is a way for people to make that happen. So individuals who hold an appropriate threshold of shares and maybe who've supported an organization's work in some way can file resolutions on those campaigns that they're interested in. It offers a tangible opportunity to be involved in the work and to do something beyond signing a petition or making a donation. And while we focus lots of attention on shareholder resolutions um, that are voted on on the AGM, um, there are other ways that shareholders can raise concern, such as just simply attending that AGM and asking questions either themselves or by transferring their proxy to someone else, for example, a member of an impacted community, for them to speak at the meeting and bring their voice directly um, to company executives. Rules of participation in all of these activities where will vary a bit by country if you are planning to do any of them. Furthermore, many of us are indirect shareholders of these large multiple multinational corporations, especially by dint of having a pension and mutual superannuation fund. And we can use that relationship, that consumer power, to raise issues of concern and or ask our fund holders to vote in favour or against resolutions uh, on our behalf that are up for voting at company meetings. And while it's true, large corporations don't pay much attention traditionally to a handful of small individual investors, these individuals will bring with them support from other members of an organization um, that's working on these concerns, customers of the company and also the general public. And with the media interest surrounding it that they can generate, it'll also get attention from larger investors. But throughout all of that involvement is the involvement of the, and the amplification of voices of the people who are most impacted by the company's action. And that is key to achieving impact and change. Those people may live far away from the corporate headquarters or may not, um, but public mobilizations and campaigns can bridge that distance. And so it's a democratization of influence, focusing the attention of the company's decision makers on possibly the unintended harm caused by their actions by shareholders and conscious consumers acting in a networked way with the people impacted. And yes, many shareholders do have a rather passive um, role in their investment. And I think that's a position that's actually encouraged largely by many corporations and financial institutions. When I speak to individual shareholders, they are usually pretty excited and enthusiastic about the actions they did not realize that they could take to make their investments work for the greater good. Uh, for some, there's a degree of embarrassment about their financial holdings. I'm often rather apologetically told that they inherited shares in the company that I'm campaigning against. And it can be a great relief um, for them to be able to put those shares to work in a way that's aligned with their values. And all of this mobilization does create change. 
Um, two recent first time proposals submitted by some of us members to Apple achieved 40 percent and 34 percent of the vote. And the first of those proposals, which was on freedom of expression and access to information, led the company to publish its first ever human rights policy. Neither of those proposals were supported by the company, um, but they did gain support from proxy advisory firms such as Glass Lewis and ISS, which helped support secure more widespread investor support. That human rights policy and subsequent dedicated shareholder activism has led Apple to make significant promises in recent weeks to increase transparency around its app takedowns and also the measures it puts in place to prevent Uyghur forced labor in its supply chain. As Margaret Mead is often quoted, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. And campaign supporters who engage in shareholder activism are just that in, act, act, in action, forming a nexus around which other concerned parties gather, gain momentum and cannot be ignored. I think Thermo Fisher should take note. Thank you. Thank you, Shonda. Um, so thank you to all of our panelists for preparing those opening remarks. And thank you to everyone who's been popping in a bunch of great questions. We will get to them um, towards the end of the panel. And I just wanted to now share a little bit about um, Thermo Fisher's response. So our coalition has been in contact with their headquarters via email um, a handful of times now, I would say three or four times at this point. Um, and their response have all been saying that it's towards criminalizing criminals inside Tibet. But we all know that just simply being a Tibetan person inside Tibet today it, um, can account towards you being a criminal. So essentially, there's absolutely no way that Thermo Fisher um, can supply these kits to any region that's currently occupied by the CCP, whether it's Tibet or East Turkestan, and claim that they're um, and ensure that their te technology is being used for anything other than violations of um, human rights of these pe of our people. Um, so I'm wondering. Also, we've seen um, really great strides from CECC and IPAC. So the Congressional Executive Commission on China has sent a letter directly to Thermo Fisher um, CEO Mark Casper. Um, asking about, you know, why is Thermo Fisher supplying DNA kits? These are the facts, these are the data. And then IPAC leaders with the Interparliamentarian Alliance on China have sent um, letters to their own governments. I think there were like over seven or eight governments where they asked their governments to do further research and to figure out what's really happening and trying to hold like, um, companies like Thermo Fisher accountable. So I wanted to ask the panel today, um, on thoughts of you know their major argument being that it's all towards criminalizing people. What are like strong arguments that you see um, from your point of view that we can use to kind of combat their um, you know one main uh, argument? Okay, so then I'll maybe take the word. Um, so. One of the arguments that, that uh, Thermo Fisher will use or is using is that the sales that, that have been documented, we don't know, you know, maybe there is more, but what has been documented is relatively limited and, and on par with normal uh, law enforcement uh, uh, use. But, but this is not a, a, a first uh, time that, that Thermo Fisher gets into trouble. By contrast, we have definitely documented large sales of, of DNA kits in, in Xinjiang before, in 2016-2017. We have documented that despite uh, US uh, uh, sanctions, some of the kits were still making it in 2021 uh, in uh, uh, Xinjiang. So this is not occurring in, in a vacuum. I think that's really, uh, really important. So since 2017, Thermo Fisher has been informed of, of the risks and the misuse of its products in different areas. One of their publications together with public uh, security has been challenged and there is a, an editorial note that's been published by, by the publisher of that uh, article stating that, well, yes, questions around informed consent and, and other ethical issues have been uh, raised. So, so this is not at all occurring in a, in a vacuum that needs to be taken into account. In fact, actually, more broadly than, than, than just uh, Xinjiang or Tibet, actually, all across China, there are no uh, satisfying uh, safeguards for 
all the uses of DNA database. So in my opinion, basically, there is nowhere in China where uh, normal law enforcement practices of using DNA database according to uh, best uh, international practices and, and respect of human rights can take place, period. And so, of course, in, in places where persecution and, and, and limits to uh, fundamental freedoms are the strongest, well, the problem is the most acute. So I think we, we should insist on the fact that, yes, let's not discuss about just volumes, but let's discuss about you know, globally how is it possible to be collaborating uh, with, with police forces in a region like, like Tibet. Uh, thank you, Eve. Is there anyone else who wanted to add a comment here? Yeah, I uh, wanted to add something and refers to a question raised by John in the uh, comments that came like 10 minutes ago. Uh, he asks how are journals regulated? Uh, so I can say for regulatory authorities, if you submit data on like a potential new medicine for approval, they will reject the entire study if you cannot document written informed consent. Um, and that is subject to inspection in the institution. So the agents from the authority can go to the institution and inspect individual files and assure that this written informed consent has been obtained. And reputed journals usually require an explicit statement in the method section of a scientific paper that written informed consent has been obtained and the work has been uh, reviewed by an ethical review body. Um, so uh, we hear from Eve that it is sometimes hard to challenge these papers, uh, but it could probably be done, for example, in writing a letter to the editor when a new publication appears, whether really written informed consent has been obtained. Um, so from that angle, we can attack Thermo Fisher as well. Yeah, so I can add quite a few things uh, here. Basically, you know, I have challenged about 80 publications and, and it's a small fraction of the total amount of literature that is problematic. Uh, it's, it's many, many hundreds of publications where you can have serious doubts that um, um, the research can be conducted ethically. And so of those, about 10% by now have been uh, retracted. This is some work that has been ongoing for over uh, two years. Sometimes the oldest publication um, that I've challenged is this so more than three years by, by now. Um, and, and really, you know, there are very clear standards um, and, and somehow um, they don't get enforced. So what I hear is that publishers, unless they can clearly document misconduct, they will not proceed with a retraction, despite the fact that not being able to document proper conduct is, is ethical misconduct in academic uh, research. So there seems to, to be a huge gap between what publishers and, and research integrity specialists are willing to do and what the well-established standards are uh, for a research. Uh, also, uh, typically research has focused on consent of the individual participants, but for DNA research, things are more complicated because, of course, when I obtain DNA profiles of individuals, this is actually affecting the entire community. Uh, you know, it, it helps calibrate tools for use in the control of those communities. So, so basically, there is a notion of group harm, there is a notion of established also, but it's just not enforced. And so basically communities could actually step up and say, wait, we were never involved in the decision to carry out research. We identify very clearly and we object to uh, this type of research as it's been conducted. And we ask that it be retracted because I think there is a clear evaluation there, um, violations there. And also it goes just beyond consent and ethical approvals because ethical approvals can be bias in really horrible ways. We have seen approvals from ethical committees of the Ministry of Public Security or the Ministry of Justice of China. Uh, what does that mean in practice when you talk about ethics approval delivered in that uh, uh, way? And there are other principles beyond uh, informed consent, which is non-maleficence, not hurting people, first do no harm, beneficence, justice, and all these principles are violated. So there is really, really numerous fronts for attacking this type of research, including research where Thermo Fisher has been involved. 
but somehow publishers are not willing to or have limited willingness to enforce those uh, standards. Uh, thank you. If Shanta, I don't want to add anything onto there. If not, we'll um, start taking the questions. I was just going to um, add, you know, to this idea of normal police activity and that this is a small contract and it's, you know, as far as we can tell, it's just for normal police activity. At least that's our agreement. Just to zoom out a bit and think of, of how this kind of argument and just this sort of myopic, narrow focused view of the different corporations and governments um, have really built the Chinese government, the Beijing regime into the repressive machine that it is. Um, how over so many years, these arguments about by Western corporations and by our governments and all those who sought to benefit or profit from being closely allied with the Chinese leadership or with corporations in China and treating China as if it's just the Chinese leadership and their model of non-democratic authoritarian rule uh, and system is somehow normal or could be normal if we just do this or that to ask them to um, promise they're not doing anything bad. <laughs> and, you know, we've, we've ended up in a situation where we have constant camps or, you know, a modern day mass internment of a, of a, of an ethnic group of the Uyghur people um, in East Turkestan or what China calls Xinjiang. We have China, you know, the Chinese Beijing moving on Hong Kong and really dismantling and destroying a free, pretty free and open society um, there in a way that you know has been done all before our eyes, and the threats on Hong Kong, or on Taiwan, and the absolute decimation of any kind of civil society in China itself, and attacks on faith groups, and all of that has happened under all of our watch and the global community until this point. And companies like Thermo Fisher, whether they're doing big contracts like Apple or small contracts, have all assisted in building this, this brutal surveillance, like beyond Orwellian state by just having, maintaining this willful ignorance or by refusing to recognize the nature of the beast that they're doing business with and the place they are. And I just, that's why it's critical that we challenge every engagement, especially like this in Tibet, in occupied Tibet, and of course, in East Turkestan. Um, and, and that, you know, it's time to do something different. There's a lot of hand-wringing about what to do over the Uyghurs, how to challenge, you know, how to effectively deal with China now that it seems Xi Jinping and, and, and the powers that be there now don't, are impervious to any kind of um, uh, criticism or, or pleas for change, but we have to recognize that we help build it by doing exactly, we help make this regime what it is by doing exactly what Thermo Fisher is doing and refusing to recognize the context and the system. And, and as Shonda said, you know, there is so much that people can do and individuals can do. I just think at this point it is about drawing. We also need to connect the dots for people. So not let it just be, this is the Uyghur issue. This is the Tibet issue. This is the issue of Falun Gong. This is Hong Kong. This is the, you know, it all um, links together and it we need to address these issues together and, and not shy away from thinking about uh, the system itself and, and the Chinese authorities needing to be responsible and the corporations who are there operating in this environment needing to be responsible and held accountable for helping empower and build and strengthen and enrich this, um, this totalitarian state. So I don't know, I just wanted to zoom out a little bit um, on that question. Sounds good, thank you. I think a lot of people resonated, saw a bunch of comments, um, thanking you for those um, remarks. 
Um, I'd like to move into a next question that was asked. It is, what should companies like Thermo Fisher do to end their complicity? Happy to talk to this and, and build on what Ladam was saying as well. I think, you know, what they should do, <laughs> stop doing deals. I, that's a, in some ways, it's a simple, a simple answer um, that belies, uh, well, they will tell us a much more complicated situation. And sort of the building on what Ladam has said, it's this really challenging this, their cognitive dissonance or their self-belief in this idea where engagement of a of the free market of a western companies it's better off we're engaging with these regimes to speak to our values and challenge them challenging them on the human rights abuses they're not and it's like well okay but in the time say apple has had a very very long and lucrative um arrangement with with, with the government in beijing China's become less free, Tibet's become more occupied, it's become more oppressive and repressive. There's a bigger so what really have they really have to question the validity of this statement that by being engaged we can create change because we we clearly aren't. Um and confronting executives, uh people who profit from these decisions with the reality of what that money is doing. Um I, it is a vital part of this. Um, you, companies can, again, hide behind ideas of like, well, they are required to maximize shareholder value. They are required to do this to, to make money. But also companies do have, are required to act in the greater good. And people are talking about the, you know, the, the, the social um, benefits that corporations should also bring and, and really executives and shareholders should should engage with that like how how many people how many people is it worth suffering so that you can get an extra big dividend it, it really is it really is quite um fundamental and difficult questions to ask but we need as Laden said to come together all of these different groups uh, and people's raising the same questions and challenging on these issues over and over again to the people who are benefiting from turning the other cheek, from looking away, pretending that everything's okay because a repressive regime has told them it's it it is. You know, Apple for for a long time has said, well, there isn't. We don't use any forced labour in our supply chain because it's been looked into by the government. So, well, this is a state mandated forced labour system. It's impossible. You can't possibly accept that on an intellectual level that, it, that it's everything is OK. Um, and it is. Yeah, it is up to us to come together and keep raising it and raising it persistently and continually. Um, I think a lot of companies just kind of expect a little you know, burst of activity because it is tiring and hard work to keep raising these issues all the time. But doing it consistently and building on it year on year, uh, we will, you know, start to to uh, get them to question uh, and ask questions about what, how they're raising their money and gaining their money. Yeah, thank you, Chandra. Um, I've been to a couple of them official locations now in the US and I can say that um, not all the employees are bad. I think it is like the corporate head office that has um, the power and knowledge. We went to New Jersey yesterday and all the employees were like really confused, came outside wanting to learn more. Um, they took our flyers, they signed the petitions. You know, they're also just human beings and they happen to be working at this evil corporation. So there's also a lot of awareness building that we can be um, uh, building around the employees and getting them on our side as well i think it's absolutely awesome. and as human beings we all kind of want the same things right we all want to be safe and secure and to spend time with our loved ones and um bringing that to the fore can be very powerful with um employees within the company who are often great drivers of change we think to the the google campaigns and, and google workers about dragon project dragonfly that really did a lot to to raise awareness and put that on the back burner Thank you. Um, I will be moving on to the next question. And we're nearing the end of the panel. So if anyone has any burning questions, I would uh, submit them um, wherever you're watching the live stream. Um, according to the definition of genocide decided by the UN, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group counts as such. 
Could the Chinese DNA campaign be said to be close enough to genocide to justify investigation? If anyone has any thoughts, um, please feel free. I think you would have like in Xinjiang to document a, a deep pattern of, of, of impact on, on, on fertility and, 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 and pregnancies, which in, in, in uh, Xinjiang has been documented, I think, rather convincingly. I don't know enough about Tibet uh, to know about that. As such, DNA collection would not, uh, I think, at least in the description that I've seen, uh, would not meet that threshold, I think. But, you know, the elements are, are, are limited. So if, if there was a, a clear impact, then that uh, would be different. But I think that what we have been seeing in Xinjiang is, is forced birth control and sterilization and abortions. I have no idea about the, the, uh, um, uh, what is seen in, in Tibet. But um, let's say the DNA collection would not be a core element in that picture, I would say. And just to add on to that, I would say that, again, this comes back to the idea of really understanding how each um, issue, each group of people links together and, and why it all matters. Tibet, f um, forced abortion sterilizations in Tibet have also been well documented um, in the past. Dr. Blake Kerr, anybody who was, uh, I grew up in the Tibet movement in the West, when uh, Dr. Blake Kerr and John Ackley, who went on to be the president of International Campaign for Tibet, when they were touring in the late 80s and uh, speaking about their experiences in Tibet, being uh, foreigners who were there and witnessed the protests in 1987 and then the subsequent crackdown in Lhasa. And Dr. Blake Kerr went on to go back to Tibet and uh, as, a, as a doctor, medical doctor, to to interview people uh, undercover to, to get the stories of Tibetan forced abortion sterilizations at the hands of the Chinese authorities. And so, you know, one thing that's been extremely disturbing with everything coming out of East Turkestan uh, for the Uyghur people um, is the way that it brings up for Tibetans a lot of our recent history under Chinese occupation and these, these horrific stories that we've heard and that have been documented over the years and all the ways in which China is uh, carrying out a genocide in Tibet um, that has, you know, all the same sort of hallmarks and features, but just it now I would say Tibet's kind of, as my colleague Tender says, it's sort of genocide 2.0 because you don't need to put people in the detention camps and round them up in this way. The surveillance, the tools of repression, and the you know the the Tibetans have been so brutally beaten down that um, and Tibet is so cut off from the world that China is really doing anything they want and people just don't know about it anymore. Um, and Tibetans have virtually no avenues to resist, though they still do. So, um, yeah. So what happens in Tibet matters to not just the people in, in East Turkestan or Xinjiang, but then to the next and the next and the next. And it, does, does East Turkestan, how long before the Uyghurs are silenced completely and we hear nothing? How long before Hong Kong, we hear nothing? You know, how long before they meet this next level of um, lockdown and uh, silencing by the Beijing authorities. That's why all of this matters and links together. Um, to add on that, uh, just echo, wanted to echo a comment from Vijay uh, sent earlier. So DNA collection in itself, I think um, it's probably going too far to call that genocide, but uh, what Vijay wrote is, is very worrisome. So he refers to uh, blood taken for identifying prisoners. Uh, to be potential organ donors, uh, so to have a database available um, to uh, find candidates for transplant uh, quite quickly or for treating wounded soldiers. So that if it is not genocide, I think this potentially military use or abuse uh, in harvesting organs from prisoners is very close to that and, and very worrisome. 
Thank you, guys. Uh, and thank you, Matt, from uh, Swedish Tibet Committee for that question. Uh, we'll now be moving into the last question of today, which is hospitals and other medical establishments purchase lots of Thermo Fisher. Perhaps reach out to large institutions like UCSF to request a boycott. So the question is around, um, I think we all know many hospitals, even schools. I think when I was in bio classes, they all end up um, ordering products, labs uh, from Thermo Fisher. So the question is around um, a possible boycott of products. Yeah, I'm happy yeah, so to. I, I think, oh. Sorry, no, Cynthia, go first. <laughs> I'm happy to speak to it. I mean, I think, um, I, I think definitely engaging with large purchasers of their products is a is a a, a very good way to go. I would um, probably start with uh, medical schools um, and hospitals associated with research institutions as well. So the sort of ethical research side of it um, can be brought in, uh, and certainly, yeah, raise raise it, ask questions. Whether it will reach a level of a boycott that would be um, um, effective, but a lot of noise and bad publicity um, it could go a long way to making sure that the company doesn't continue to try and hide behind its sort of mealy-mouthed excuses and reasoning um, and so it can no longer um, uh, ignore the questions that are being asked and of course the more questions that are asked and the more places where this issue is raised the more the more you know maybe talked about in different journals or in, in in different places in the media the more it becomes a worry to the company that it might be bad for business in order to to continue to engage um, and uh, uh, and sell its products for, uh, you know, repressive uh, uh, uses. Yeah, so I think it's actually possible to get a lot of visibility on that issue. I'm quite convinced we could actually get like a nice editorial in one of the top scientific journals uh, worldwide because the standards are there, because that issue has already been raised uh, actually at the highest scientific level. And I think what could be done that is new is actually the communities stepping up and saying, well, you have published all those standards, you know, when are you going to uphold them? And, and I think there you can really get a lot of visibility in the scientific community. And of course, these are very large purchasers and they are, you know, they understand ethics. And so when they understand the problem, they will be willing to, to act. And quickly, I wanted to uh, add a, a short uh, um, element. The U.S. administration has new powers to regulate transactions with police uh, in foreign countries um, and intervene in any sales. And so that needs to be implemented, but the authority is there. So actually um, <clears throat> contacting the U.S. administration to ask, uh, uh, to say, well, that kind of sales is unacceptable. Do something about it. That will be meaningful. And for me, the standard is that indeed Western companies cannot stay in the forensic genetics market in China because it's impossible to carry out normal work uh, there. Uh, thank you so much. I think I will be able to give folks a minute um, to do their closing remarks. And I'd like to start by inviting Shonda first. We're running out of time, so I'll be very quick. Um, keep talking about it. Keep talking to other people about it. Um, bring in um, different groups um, and different networks. And together, we can all work together to raise this issue and to make sure it can't still continue to be ignored. Thank you, Shonda. Um, Dr. Eve Moreau? Yeah, I've used plenty of time, so I'm happy to give uh, my 30 seconds left to someone else. Uh, Dr. Uwe Meyer? <clears throat> well, uh, I think Vijay read my mind, uh, so he said uh, he wanted to take uh, that further in another webinar, so uh, we, we should really spread that news further on as much as we can. And it was a good discussion. I think we have also obtained uh, many good ideas to, to continue that campaign. And Ajahn Hadden? Yeah, I would just say that um, I think this is, well, first of all, I want to thank our experts here for working on this issue and also for the Uyghurs and just staying on this. And I want to say to everyone who's watching that we, like, this is what we do. We just have to fight. And that's how change happens. And 70 years on, Tibetans should not, Tibetans should be over. The Chinese authorities, it's David versus Goliath in a way like uh, beyond imagine, um, one can imagine. And Tibetans are still fighting. 
and 7 million Tibetans in the Buddhist nation are still challenging one of the most powerful nations on earth. And so what we can do with Thermo Fisher down the street here, I think, you know, we just have to think in those in the, in that way, we can do a lot and we're free to do it. And so um, I, I have a feeling that we can, we can really make change on this. And every time we can make change at this level, it, contributes you know and uh to the next level of change and it's like a really important ripple in the pond so um that we'll keep at it and thanks sft for leading this uh thank you everyone uh stay tuned afterwards we will be playing a video of a short clip of our visit to a thermo fisher location um thank you all so much for tuning in and being open to learning and a big shout out to the panelists for taking their time to be with be with us today. As a reminder, we are halfway through the Global Week of Action, so everyone can jump on our campaign still. They can visit our Thermo Fisher location themselves. You can sign our petition, which has over 7,500 signatures now. You can send an email directly to Mark Casper, um, CEO of Thermo Fisher, and Sandy Pound by going on our social medias and clicking on the email to target campaign. And you can even do a hands-off Tibetan DNA selfie, uh, hand selfie. So there are so many ways to get involved. Please check out um, SFT, ITN, Free Tibet, all of our social media. Um, there's so many ways. And this is just the beginning. So um, there will be lots more to see um, around this campaign. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today. And be stay tuned for our video. We're gathered, we're gathered outside Thermo Fisher, Jersey today with other young activists. Thermo Fisher claims to be an ethical company, but there's nothing ethical about aiding and embedding China in stealing Tibetan DNA. Thermo Fisher serves science, not China. Serves science, not China. Tibetan DNA.